it's five minutes after 6.30, I'd say let's start. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Sander Pelgrim. I am service designer at Livework Studio and part of the SDN NL team. Now on behalf of SDN NL, um, uh, I'd like to welcome you uh, to this very first online workout that SDN NL organizes. We are very pleased to see you've signed up in great numbers for today's uh, exciting edition. Let's start with a Zoom exercise. Later on, we'll be using this feature to everyone who is attending a SDN NL meetup for the first time, please raise your hands. It's a feature in Zoom, and I see a lot of people already raising their hands. Forty-five out of seventy, more or less. Thanks a lot. And then for everybody who has been here for before, who has attended before, please now raise your hand. Cool, you got this. Eight, eight or nine. Yeah, it makes sense. Those offline versions are quite a bit smaller, right? Okay, welcome everybody, good to have you. That was great. Uh, today's workout session uh, explores the value of service design in a startup context. And it's led by two men whose names sound like they should consider starting a rock band together. Jesse Grimes and Mike Binder. Jesse is a familiar face to the SDN community. Jesse is Senior Vice President of the Global Service Design Network, Editor-in-Chief of his journal, and Co-Founder and Head of Training of the SDN Academy. In his spare time, he is a freelance service designer with 13 years experience in the field, having wor worked for a wide range of global clients with a specific expertise in financial sector. Currently, he works for multinationals in the, uh, a multinational in the agriculture sector, as well as a Berlin-based clean tech startup and a blockchain-based social impact startup in The Hague. Mike is innovation expertise lead at Board of Innovation in Antwerp, with over 12 years experience working across industry, helping Fortune 500s to innovate like startups. Mike has a multi multidisciplinary background across uh, design, business, and innovation management applied through hands-on consulting, training, and facilitation of tailored innovation programs. Mike is an international keynote speaker, author, guest lecturer, and member of the board at the Global Innovation Institute, GINI. Um, he applies innovation strategy, design thinking, lean startup, business model innovation in both B2B and B2C markets at clients like GE, ING, Bank, ATOS, AB InBev, Logitech, and many more. And today's session will be uh, graciously moderated by Stina van Hoofd. Stina is a service designer at the Belgian service design agency Night Moves. Together with her colleague David, she hosts the, the service design podcast where they talk with designers from all over the world. Stina is the co-founder of our Belgian sibling, the SDN chapter Belgium. Uh, in which role she's dedicated to putting service design on the agenda in Belgium. So before giving the virtual microphone to Stina, I'd like to make sure you keep track of upcoming workouts as well, because more exciting ones are planned. We have a future probing, probing workout coming up with Summon Futures, content strategy with Informat, and behavioral design with my lovely LiveWork colleague, Anna. Uh, can I get an Awkwardly silent round of home applause for James, for Jesse Grimes, and Mike Binder, and Stina van Hoofd. Enjoy your workout, guys. Over to you, Stina. Great. Thank you, Senna. Um, there's a lot of people already joining. I see 82, and I just read in the chat that there will be more coming, so that's great. We have enough spots, so please feel free to invite more people. Uh, we will try to make this session as interactive as possible, even though it's a one-way webinar. At the end of the two talks, we will still have an interactive uh, part, so please stick around. Uh, during the talks, I would like to ask you to add all your questions to the Q&A part. So not the chats, of course you can interact with each other in the chats, but there is a separate Q&A part at the bottom. And there you can uh, ask a question. At the end of the two talks, we will select some questions and we will be asking those to Jesse and Mike. 
and they will be answering them. So please add the questions to the Q&A and uh, what you can also do um, is upvote questions. So if you like a question and you would really like that question to be asked at the end, please upvote it. So that will help us with selecting uh, the right questions that you want to be answered. Um, I think that's it. Uh, I think we are ready to get started. Uh, so I would like to hand over the screen to Jesse. Okay, thanks, Tina. Uh, thanks also for everyone joining us in this quite interesting third edition of this talk. Mike and I have given this a, a couple of times before, but this is a, a, a new circumstance for us and I'm happy to see how it goes. Um, I'll jump right into my talk so let me start my screen now i've got a little bit of an introduction so far um, from senna thank you very much um, i will go through that very quickly and uh, yeah and get into the rest of my talk so i've been doing uh, service design or design consulting for about 21 years i'm a service designer since 2008 i'm working as senna said uh, based here in amsterdam but with clients um, uh, around Europe at the moment. I do work in my spare time for the SDN and for Touchpoint. And actually one of the connections to this talk is a lot of work I've done in the last years um, has been with innovators or innovation contexts and with startups. So actually even, even more specific than that, in, in uh, about last year, we had a special edition of Touchpoint, which uh, both my contributed articles to, and this was looking at um, this overlap between service design and innovation and service design in the, in the world of startups. So both of our talks kind of touch on this. Uh, in addition, I've run some courses on this topic in, in Berlin, Berlin, Shanghai, uh, Toronto, and Taipei. Um, and I would invite you at the end of the, end of the event, if, if this uh, content interests you, to look up that, that edition of Touchpoint. So in my talk, I'm going to take it in, in two parts. I've got two kind of perspectives here. The first being, what is the value of service design, of our way of thinking, of the, of the perspective and the tools we bring to startups, to innovation contexts? And the second part is aimed more at service designers and trying to say, OK, well, what is the potential? And then what are the challenges of working in these environments uh, in our existing role? It is, uh, it is a place where there are quite few of us um, present, I think. So that's going to be the, the split of my talk. Um, I'll jump into the first section and that, that's okay. What is the value of service design in our thinking for startups? And I started this exploration already a few years ago, um, noticing and, and wanting to see how visible we were within the world of startups. This is, um, it's actually, it, it's the data is a few years old, but I think it generally still holds. It shows in what fields, in what sectors, startups are mostly active. And FinTech um, really was uh, kind of on top of this list. It was also actually where some of my first startup experience was. And then I found a conference which is aimed at the design community within the FinTech space. This is a conference that's been going on for about three or four years. In fact, they have an edition coming up uh, next month in, in uh, June in London in some form or other. But what I wanted to share here was the focus on who's being uh, invited or, or encouraged to attend this conference. Lots of different design roles, but service design isn't listed there. So this was actually, to me, again, some kind of reinforcement that our, that our activity, our presence isn't, isn't really felt in, the, in this world of startups. So one of my kind of models or, or my, yeah, my belief here is that our work, our thinking, our tools can help innovators and startups develop, develop uh, better products to have stronger customer relationships and to create more value for their customers than ever before. Now, if we look at where this opportunity for service design lies, I think it's interesting to start with what the typical innovation process looks like. And this is um, at a very high level, startups and innovation settings aim first to develop a concept, uh, find a concept and develop it, test it, and then go on to scale that. And if we look just at this as a high level, there is already a big difference to the environment that we're familiar with in service designers. Uh, as service designers, the pressure within these teams is much higher. Um, they're typically smaller teams. 
And if they're really following the playbook of, of startups, they are apt to change what they're doing from one day to the next. They can make fast iterations, but also pivot and be entirely different. This is pretty different than, than a large organization, a big bank, for example, where we might be normally working. I also think it's interesting to start by saying, okay, what, is, what are uh, innovation projects trying to accomplish? And that is three things. It's not just that they come up with creative ideas, which is a, a successful concept. It's also not just ideas that customers really want, so ones that are delivering value, but really critically, it's new ideas, innovations that are sustainable and profitable, so, so ones that are viable. This is the, the three core things any startup needs to be concerned with. And for the good news, I think that we as service designers and our, our, our tools and our techniques can certainly help in providing value and, and supporting that search for a successful concept and, and proving that it has value. And service design may well play a role in that third question about viability. I also mapped here some of the activities which are common to service design against those, those three things that startups or innovators are looking for. And I won't go through all of them, but you'll recognize them as being um, particular activities that we use. The last one, as you can see, I've said in some cases, service designers who are also business designers, that's probably the role that's supporting this quest for viability. But typically our other activities are more focused on determining either the concept or the value uh, part of that equation. I also spent a moment to look at that Google Ventures uh, design sprint process, which not only are we more and more familiar with in our community, but is uh, taken the startup world also by, by storm. Um, and that is the, the five day process through which uh, the followers aim to find a somewhat validated process and, 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 and take it forward in, in some way or another. And I do have, of course, a, a big criticism about that. Um, I would normally ask an audience to shout something out, but it's a bit difficult. Um, but people usually say, which is my critique here, that there's no user involvement until that last, in that last fifth day of a design sprint. So taking that into account, and when I've run design sprints in the past, I try to bring in the service designers toolkit and the activities we use throughout those five days. So for example, in the very beginning, we can already start doing contextual research and perhaps even rough journey maps of an as is situation. Um, we can go through and involve co-creation, which is a, a key element of service design, of course, not only in the sketching of solutions, but also involve uh, uh, end users in the building of prototypes, uh, uh, for example, and not just the prototypes that may be familiar within a uh, design sprint process, but all the other prototyping methods that we're familiar with uh, as service designers. And of course, not just simple one-on-one -on -one interviews, which is used in the design sprint process to test the validity of a prototype, but the many more techniques that we can, that we can bring to bear on a, on a research problem or a research question. So this was one other way that I said, okay, how can we, how can we address what we do to a technique that's familiar to, to, to startups? I'd also like to go through now and, and take a bit of the, the perhaps kind of cynical view and why is it that we are not so present within startups and are there not some inherent contrasts between the way we think, the way we act and what Lean Startup as a methodology prescribes. So the next slides I try to compare and compress those, those two and find where those, those potential problems lay. The first, of course, is that Lean Startup is very product centric, whereas we as service designers uh, really take a, a service centric role. Our, our view is much more holistic. We think about service experiences over time. Within a uh, Lean Startup or a startup team, you've got people with product in their job title, product in the activity names. It's already um, a, a different mindset and a different set of semantics. There is also, I think, within the world of Lean Startup, a much shallower attempt to understand who users are. It can be as simplistic as, okay, does this product that we want to bring to the market relieve a certain pain? Whereas as service designers, we're much more willing and able, I think, to look into deeper questions about who those users are, um, what are they trying to accomplish, and visualizing them in, in, in techniques and tools such as a persona, super simple to us, but I've seen used very little uh, within startups. 
I also think that the concept validation approaches that startups use are typically pretty simplistic. They could be landing pages. Sometimes I critique them as being a bit deceptive that they launch services that don't exist just to see if people are interested. There can be a, a heavy reliance on Facebook for this validation activities. Um, whereas we as service designers can bring a broader range of both prototyping and research tools and techniques to those questions and actually I think uncover richer insights about whether a concept is going to work or not. There is, I think, within the startup and within innovation or startup context in general, this concept of a product operating in a vacuum, not really the understanding that a product also needs some kind of, uh, for example, customer support uh, uh, around it. And it's not just an app that exists in a vacuum and that developers can only satisfy themselves with a focus on that app. We bring instead a really more holistic understanding of that experience and the service experience and indeed the whole ecosystem uh, in which that that service is, is is being brought to the market a couple more i do think there is a heavy focus on solutions and i've seen this also with my startup clients they typically have a solution that has been uh, sprung to mind in one of the founders heads and they're trying to bring that solution to market they're in love with the solution if you if you know that that motto and not in love with the problem they're trying to get through a process quite quickly and once they feel that there's some match grow it into a big business i think as service designers we are really more focused on that problem in the beginning and i think that's that's really important and i have to admit it can be a real challenge to try to slow momentum and say look at folks you're really you're too much focused on that solution and we need to make sure um, that it really makes sense that it that our, our solution is going to resonate with people and, and that we really understand them as, as well as we think we do and also the startup of course is really focused on getting an mvp a minimal viable product out the door and this is typically only aimed at satisfying the basic requirements of a undemanding set of users or early evangelists um, and get some traction amongst them and only then try to grow on to, to grow that whereas service designers are i think and i hope from the beginning more interested in what that eventual service will be and what and what its characteristics are and as i mentioned again this early evangelist steve blank talks about this um, it's it can be satisfying for startups to say, look, at, we've got a few friends, we've got a very big pain, they will put up with a, a, a not ideal product and, and potentially pay us some money, and we'll take that as enough and we'll scale it from there. We think on the other hand, I, uh, that we need a, not just a small target group, but a good understanding of who the representational users of the service will be for also the, the more mature service down the line. A couple more thoughts, and this follows on from that MVP concept. I think typically the MVP is just looking at a small slice of what is feasible with the aim of growing that over time. And I've liked and have seen in our community earlier before kind of a plea for making sure that we aim for things that are not just minimally feasible, but even if they're minimal, they touch on the other aspects that a successful service needs to be, that it's also to some extent lovable, uh, usable, that it has value, and of course that it's feasible. So that's the first part of my talk. That's really, okay, where is there um, uh, some p potential for us and value in our, our thinking amongst startups and innovation contexts, and, and also what, what are those contrasts or those challenges? And my second part is now more addressed to the service designers amongst us, and that is, okay, what is the potential there and what are the challenges on getting work with startups and, and innovation context? So I've positioned this as five, uh, five kind of tips, five advice, uh, things that come from my experience. The first I called being a chameleon and that has to do with not really being set on what you call yourself and what you call the activities you're doing. If you aren't, if, if service design is not recognized as a job title and you think it's better understood that you're doing design thinking, um, I've had to do this myself and bite my tongue a little bit, but it meant that I was able to accomplish work that was valuable. So position yourself in a way that you know addresses the problems um, that the startup might have or a way that delivers value that they weren't expecting you might give, but don't 
uh, attempt to fit in rather than really being dogmatic about what you call yourself and the activities you're doing and just what discipline they come from. As a second, this is uh, something I've done at the very beginning of every engagement I've done with a, with a startup, but also my, my normal clients. It's possible to create a visualization called a service ecosystem, which forces someone or, or raises the awareness of a team very early on about the fact that their service is not existing in a vacuum, that it exists over time, that there are a whole bunch of interactions that their users are going to be carrying out with them across a whole bunch of different touch points. It's a visualization that you create with the team. It's quite easy to understand. Um, I do share with it in the resources at the end of my, my slides if you want to read it about a bit more. But it's essentially a 90 minute or so work, a workshop that very quickly establishes the value of your role, but also your, your thinking as a service designer. I do think it's important to get comfortable with canvases. We are in our community of service design more and more doing this, but by it, it's not a match for how startups and innovation settings are using canvases. The value proposition canvas, the business model canvas, also things like the platform design toolkit um, are very, are used throughout startups and throughout innovation context and are typically done in workshop settings. We as service designers are very good at facilitating workshops. Um, we're, we're just, all we need to do in this case is to get comfortable with these specific canvases and, and how to actually uh, to run them and, and to facilitate those activities. And startups sometimes also don't have those people on board or they don't have any experience doing it. So adding this to your toolkit of skills um, can, make you, can make you more valuable. As a fourth, and this is just simply the way you talk and the way you behave in meetings and, and the way you try to raise awareness of, of, of your way of thinking, that is simply to push the service perspective continuously. So again, remind people that their service is not being designed or launched in a vacuum, that they need to think about the service experience over time and the different ways that someone will interact with that experience. Um, that's super important and it gets the people away from their, their solution focus and and hopefully to see a bit the bigger picture. And as a very last one, uh, kind of like the, the canvases topic, I think it's quite important to get to know and get familiar with the startup language. There are some things that are entirely new and, and alien to you if you've only worked in very big organizations about funding, uh, for example, how startups are funded and how they go through that process. But there are also some things that are kind of unique to the startup world, like terms like customer development, which have an, a lot of overlap with things we do, um, but have a different name. And it helps to just understand what they're talking about and what that terminology is, because it's, it's typically new at, at the beginning of your work with them. So those were the five different tips. And as a last thing, I, I should say, I will share my slides with you. And there's a link at the bottom of the slide um, as well, and I can share it in the chat. These are some books that I've been reading over the past years in old school paper format. Um, of course, there's a lot of more online resources, but these were all kind of helpful to me in one way or another to dive into this world. And I can recommend it, um, that you may not get to all of them, but to, to pick through some of them. And uh, yeah, they're, they're quite good. They're quite good, helpful resource. To begin with. So that's the last part of my slides. Um, I will, as you can see there, there's a URL I can share back in the chat so that you can find these things on my website, um, as well as the presentation that, that you can download there. I guess there might have been some questions in the talk, so that's, that's great. Stina will uh, help us get through those at the end. But uh, thanks for the attention, and I will now hand it over to Mike for his second part of the talk. Great stuff. Thank you very much, Jesse. I will just share my screen as well. Brilliant. All right. Um, hello, everybody. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to speak to you all. I hope everybody's safe and well. I really appreciate your time uh, at the moment, even though yeah, things are a little bit grim in some places, but really appreciate you being here. Um, my name is Mike Pinder, as introduced. So I'm Innovation Expertise Lead at Board of Innovation. Um, so I come from a cross-disciplinary background in design, business, and innovation. Uh, lots of hands-on experience in new technology R&D, um, sitting on the board of advisors at the Global Innovation Institute, um, did some guest editing on the uh, 
touch point journal issue as well. And um, yeah, I sort of really switch hats across those different domains, working with large Fortune 500 clients uh, all over the world. Um, what really drives me is fundamental why questions. I, these are some of the books I had as a, as a kid growing up. And um, I was really interested in getting to the un underlying reasons as to what's happening and, and why behind lots of different things. And that's what I really get to do at Board of Innovation. Uh, we're going through some uh, quite big changes at the moment, as you can imagine. Um, and, um, but generally, our consensus has been that playtime is over and it's really about delivering uh, business and societal value um, in, in terms of the innovation process. Uh, we work with uh, large corporates all over the world. Uh, we have, a, have teams in uh, Singapore, Amsterdam, uh, Antwerp and New York and working cross industry in B2B and B2C. So a lot of our workshops tend to look like this after, after a day, very informal, lots of hands-on canvases as Jesse was mentioning, loads of post-its, very uh, much hands-on doing uh, throughout the innovation process. Um, so this is what we do in terms of our services. So it's a strategy, business design and talent development. There's a lot of buzzwords on that sheet um, uh, in terms of what we do. But you might be asking yourself, well, where does service design actually fit into this? And this is a slight preview of the slightly controversial perspective, I would say. I'm taking a more challenging perspective um, for the sake of a discussion and the Q&A at the end of the session. Um, so I'm looking at really applying service design while innovating like a startup within Fortune 500 teams, so much more on the corporate uh, side of things. So we're going to cover four uh, quick topics. Um, we're going to look at what, what, what this is actually about, so what, what I actually wrote about in the Touchpoint Journal, why I consider that's important, and then some key takeaways um, as, uh, for you guys as, a, as practitioners in service design in some form. Um, so yeah, this was the issue that, uh, that the article appeared in. Um, if you haven't seen it already, I definitely recommend having a read. Um, it goes into a lot more detail than, than what I can explain, obviously, to you in our short time to, today. Um, hopefully, some of you may have read it. So if you have, that's great. If you haven't, you have about 15, 20 minutes to go to that link and have a quick scan. Um, but I'll be, I'll be covering quite a lot of it um, in, in the next few slides. Um, so generally, it's, it's easy to focus on the tools, methods and practice. And when we were speaking in New York and in Antwerp on this topic, the discussion very much revolved around the tools, the methods, what to use and when. Um, but from my point of view, from a, from a why point of view, I really want to go a bit more high level, trying to understand what's really going on on a higher level um, in terms of the wider innovation process, not just within a specific discipline like service design. So my motivation here is to, to deliberately provoke the community into a critical discussion about itself. That's what really drove what, what I did in that article. Um, so in that, I mean, I want to explain how corporate innovation teams actually go about de-risking um, projects within the innovation process in relation specifically to service design. Um, I also wanted to explain how service design tackles high level uncertainty, particularly in corporate startup projects. Um, and then I argue if service design really functions as an effective and standalone discipline in corporate startup projects um, or whether it doesn't really have a right to play there. Um, so quite controversial. Um, so bear with me. I'm playing devil's advocate a little bit here to uh, provoke some constructive discussion. So that gives you a bit of a, about what it's actually about. Um, then so why is this important? Why should you care uh, about this? So um, I want you to look beyond service design as an individual discipline and then critically locate it in the wider innovation process. Service design isn't the end in itself, neither is lean startup and business model innovation. It's part of a wider process. So what is that process? So you're going to get some context in that um, in a second. Um, to help service designers know what the whole innovation process is um, in a corporate setting so that you can work more effectively within it. And um, that's super important. Um, and also to understand what it is we're actually doing on a more high level abstract level in this knowledge economy. And this is the term that's been bounced around in the news all the time. So we're transitioning to a servitization economy a knowledge economy um, and all the rest of it. But um, it doesn't really get talked about outside of the academic world and in some, some buzzword headlines. So we need to understand what's actually happening at the level of knowledge within the innovation process itself. So what's actually going on? What's inside the black box of, of innovation with service design? So some of the key points that I want to raise with you and, and really get your feedback on during the Q&A uh, panel discussion. 
Um, starting off, let's get this one out of the way. I already uh, mentioned it briefly in the, in the intro, but um, all models and tools are wrong, okay? Um, but some are useful. Um, this is a really important quote. So yes, uh, canvases in themselves are completely useless, but some are useful as part of a wider process. And that's really our skill as practitioners to figure out what to use when and why. Um, so for service design, I'd say along with other tools and methodologies, they're not enough by themselves, but they're part of this wider process. And that process is creating uh, value in some kind. And we'll, we'll touch upon what I actually mean by that in a second. It's, it's not about being seen to be using post-its and sharpies. It's, a, it's not about creating theater productions. It's about creating impact that solves um, problems in a valuable way. Uh, and we do this through innovation and you ask people what innovation is and it becomes this utter meaningless discussion. Um, this was a tag cloud I made from speaking to people over several years, asking them what they thought innovation was. And it's pre predominantly, as you can see, about newness and about creating, it's about value, it's about markets, um, it's about needs, problems, business. It's a whole range of things, but it, it can really get quite confusing as to what it is we mean by this when we're, when we're all pretending like we have the same common understanding. Um, so for sake of simplicity, it's, we'd argue that it's, it's the commercialization of ideas. Yes, it needs to have valuable impacts and all the rest of it. In its most pure sense, this is the, the most beautiful definition I found and the most simplistic one that I would encourage you to use um, because it just gets to this duality, this two-sided thing. It's, it's about um, new concepts and being able to make them viable at the same time. So when we look at the innovation process, it's, it's a process designed to manage risk, uncertainty, and ambiguity whilst creating value. Okay, so it's a whole bunch of things at once. Um, and what do we mean by value? This is something that I'm working on at the moment and just published something on. Um, if you imagine this plane, when we talk about value, it's something monetary, it has net benefits, and it's transactional. Um, and these are imaginary value peaks and it's our role as practitioners to try and find these value peaks and create something that solves these customer needs and problems. Um, and if we look at the landscape at the moment, um, it's incomplete uh, turmoil. So it's, it's being um, utterly disrupted. There's old values where it once lay is now completely uh, disappearing, new value peaks are appearing. So our role is, is, is very important right now to try and understand what's happening in the value landscape in order to generate new value from it. Um, but how does innovation actually work? So we know what we're looking to get to, but how does it actually work? Um, and there are many different approaches and, and, and processes, but uh, let's, let's take a look at it at, at a bit of a high level. So we understand the fuzzy front end. Everybody uh, is, is familiar with this, I'm sure, in the community. Um, but we split this uh, fuzzy front end up into various phases. So it's about discovery. It's about uh, making sure you have a problem fit, uh, making sure that your solution solves your problem, making sure there's a market fit, and then scaling. And this is the innovation funnel or process. Um, now, what are we actually doing in here in terms of knowledge? We're looking at alternating between researching something and then testing assumptions, maybe going back to some research and testing assumptions throughout this, this process of knowing. Um, so we go from this very unknown, unknown state down to more known knowns, and then uh, we, we can classify that we know something at the end of it because um, the consumers are responding in a way um, that we, we, we're expecting. So knowledge in this sense is what we consider justified true belief. This is what we're looking for throughout the innovation process across those various phases. Um, and as Jesse mentioned, yeah, typically projects start from a technology feasibility perspective, then maybe try and retrofit a business model, but it's really about understanding the customer desirability problems first. So not just jumping to lean startup, but falling in love with the problems, making sure you, you're solving the right problems before you go anywhere near the, the solution space and the, and the business case. So when you do these things, in the right order. Um, this is you know, what we call the innovation sweet spot. It's, it's getting it logically in the right way so that you can kill projects that just don't make sense um, if nobody wants it. Um, so this is where the customer desirability, business model viability, and technical feasibility fit in. The, the knowing phases across the innovation process. Um, and then how does that relate to the actual methodologies um, below that? So we have things like design thinking, lean startup, design sprints, uh, prototyping, uh, business model innovation, and agile development. These are all iterative processes to um, enable knowing across the innovation process. So this gives you a complete capability to enable you to know across the process. And 
um, yes, you'll still notice I haven't used the word service design yet. So um, this is what I was building up to um, in the article, um, looking at uh, what this whole process is and how does service design in a corporate context fit into this. So I want you to consider the process as a, an adaptive learning system. So it's, it's, this is a process to enable knowing and service design is just one part of that process. Um, but it's a wider process that we need to be fully um, understanding of. Um, so think of them as methodologies to help make knowing manageable and repeatable. And this is what we mean by an organizational capability, in this case, an innovation specific capability to create new value. And it's designed to get away from the typical approach in a corporate context, which is you uh, build something, as Jesse was saying, like in, in a design sprint format, but maybe over several months and several million uh, euros in development, but you build something at great cost and you only release it at the end. Then typically you try and retrofit a business case into there. Um, yeah, this is where it all goes wrong. People predicting X millions in three to five years, they all know it's complete rubbish but everyone sits around and agrees anyway so this whole process is designed to split up um, the the knowing process into manageable um, pieces and chunks so that you can reduce risk across the whole innovation process that's really what's going on on a high level now on to service design then so um, i'd argue that service design has got an issue here because it's 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 used at different parts of the process without being integral to the full process. So it's, it's stratified usage and it repeats a, a lot of what other tools are using in design thinking and in, in lean startup in particular. Um, so there's duplicates and there's crossovers and it can create a lot of confusion for project teams who maybe have just started working in design thinking and then suddenly a service designer comes in and starts using the same things at a different part of the process. It can get very confusing. Um, teams ultimately don't really care about labels or disciplines. They're just trying to get to knowing as quickly as possible. Um, and yeah, so if you look at uh, the service design doing book, um, there are four different phases that get defined within that. And I would argue that this is where service design is most influential across the innovation process. You'll notice there's a bit of a gap around business model innovation. Um, typically the, the, the tools for service design are about the as is and to be situations. Um, so we have this uh, conflicting situation where teams aren't able to really use service design tools as service design tools because they're labeled and used as something else. So what are the consequences of this for service design? Um, this means in a corporate context um, that service design just doesn't get invested in um, because it's not known as well as other tools and methods. Um, if at all, it can just add more confusion. So therefore it has a meaning and relevancy issue for the actual innovation managers and buyers who have the budget to um, buy these kinds of services. And even design thinking is still struggling to be uh, accepted at the strategic level, despite being used since the 1960s. So it's, um, you know, only now it's starting to get traction. So I'd say service design is slightly lagging behind there as well. Um, and innovation leaders, they just care about the speed to knowing with the, with the least amount of risk to achieve new business and growth impact. They really don't care about labels. Um, if you look at how HR goes about creating an innovation capability, as we've looked at, they typically first invest in agile implementation. So implementing just a bit better in an, in an iterative uh, de-risking way. Then they'll jump back to the other side of the innovation process, maybe investing in design thinking trainings. Um, then they maybe realize, yes, we now need some lean startup training on more of the solution side. And then they realize, yes, now we need a business case. And then they move into the uh, business model innovation capability development. So again, service design isn't really featuring in this current um, understanding of the innovation process. Um, so it, it, we, it get primarily, I would argue, gets used to diagnose existing services and evaluate um, new solutions whilst they're being implemented, but not to really um, it doesn't really step into the design thinking domain too much because that's, that's really understanding the unknown, unknown problems. It's not about as is or to be's, it's a really unknown situation. Um, and it's also difficult to use service design um, for radical and dis disruptive um, innovation outcomes as well, um, which we'll touch on in a second in a bit more detail. So what corporates are ultimately paying for, okay, in this, in this situation is the ability to know, and they're wanting to do that better, cheaper, and quicker than the competition. It's really about generating that capability, maybe as a separate structure or entity within the larger organization, um, but that's really what they're paying for. They're not paying for a label or, or anything else. It's how do we do this quicker and cheaper and better? 
Um, so where does service design fit into these four innovation types? This is a very important one because again, looking at the high level, you need to understand what these tools and methods are most suited to be able to serve. Um, so there's four different types of innovation. There's incremental re-innovation, which is um, building on existing technical competencies, doing the, the same thing that you're doing in the same uh, products and services, the same markets, but just a little bit better, which fits the existing business model. Uh, then there's disruptive innovation. This is where you uh, redo your business model entirely and then you disrupt industries as a result of it. The third one is radical innovation. This is very much R&D technical competency focus. So this takes a lot of investment, uh, new technologies um, to then later retrofit into needs and problems. And then architectural innovation, which is the most difficult one to achieve, where you need an entirely new uh, disruptive technology and a new business model, usually in a, the new product and service in a completely different market, um, which is very rarely happens. So, um, I would say that service design is best suited at doing incremental re-innovation because you already have an as-is situation to apply the tools and methods to um, and also to uh, more radical innovation projects because it's a long-term um, technical um, creation of something that will, will require an integrated service in order to execute. So it's not necessarily grounded in knowable unknown needs and problems from customers, but it may be something entirely new that can't be retrofitted to uh, customer needs and problems. So I would, I would argue maybe controversially that it's only suited to those um, innovation project types. Um, so really the, 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 the thing I want you to take away from this is that um, it's about this, the innovation process is about generated validated learning or invalidated learning. And this is what I mean by knowing it's about, um, going through this process rough and dirty. It's got nothing to do with individual tools and methods. You're, you're trying to get evidence-based validated learning. Um, and this is one of the most important templates that we, we use at the board. It's, it's an assumption learning card. So it's what, uh, what do you know to be true and valid about your assumptions and what evidence do you have for that uh, validation? So it's evidence-based knowing that even the CEO of an organization uh, can't challenge. So this is what it's about enabling you to create is this knowledge that you can you can demonstrate in terms of using that in a project to make decisions about what to invest in people time and resources or not um, and that's really the important thing um, so what are the implications of all this um, for service designers moving forward and there are four takeaways i'd like to finally leave you with um, first one is that accepted or not, but I would argue that we're managing the pursuit of knowing as quickly and cheaply as possible to solve customer problems. That's, that's our role as service designers, design thinkers, whatever you want to label it. We're doing the innovation process. So try to add value across the whole innovation process. Don't just stick to your silo of, of service design, but think about the, the broader picture, what's going on and how you actually fit in with that. Um, secondly, understand the process at a higher level in order to see where your specific skills will fit in or where they don't, or maybe somewhere that you would like to train in, like business model innovation, for instance. Um, so you need to learn how to interface your service design skills across that whole process. We saw some of the gaps in, in the diagram before, so how can you adapt your, your tool set, your process? Maybe you need to train to, to better bridge those gaps, um, which would be super useful. Uh, thirdly, uh, Jesse mentioned this one as well, but learn to speak the language of innovation, not just service design, not just lean startup. Um, and then think about teams emerging from the different phases of the innovation or knowing process. So how can you interface with them? How can you help them move quickly forward from there? Um, and lastly, yeah, forget about the labels, really focus on enabling knowing quickly. That's, that's the, the, the main takeaway here. Um, so try to bridge the gaps uh, across the whole process. Um, and then this would make you an enabler of knowing, enabler to the speed of knowing, should I say, across the whole innovation process. So really getting you to broaden out your perspectives and, and, and see where you fit on, on a more high level. That's, that's my goal of this talk. So hopefully uh, that's what's happened. Um, if you want to learn a little bit more about um, COVID-19 and, and innovation strategy and value peaks, uh, I just published a piece uh, this week on that. Um, there's a tiny link there. You can, you can check it out. Uh, happy to hear your thoughts on that as well. But for now, uh, looking forward to having a interactive discussion 
uh, with you all. Um, we've got a, a QR code in a second, which I'll put up on the screen so you can scan that for the uh, interactive session. And there's also a link at the bottom. Um, so let's, let's have a, a really good discussion. We had a great discussion in New York and in Antwerp. So looking forward to a good virtual um, challenging critical debate now. So there's the code and uh, yeah, I'll open it back up to uh, Stina and uh, hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Mike. Okay, let's, uh, let's try to have a discussion with almost 100 people through this uh, online uh, webinar. Uh, you can all scan this code. Or you can uh, open the link that you see uh, below and in uh, like a couple of seconds uh, I will ask uh, Mike to stop sharing the screen and I will share mine but I'll, and then we will first move on to some uh, easy questions and later on to some more critical dilemmas that we will try to solve together. Okay, hope everyone's in. I will uh, just to be sure already uh, copy the link of the uh, poll in the chat so you can all open it there later as well I think I think Stina we need to we need to skip this you, I think your connection is really not not good enough to do this um, so what I propose that Mike and I will pick up the questions that we've got coming through the q and a I'll read out some of the um, the top ranked questions and I'll Mike and I will kind of determine um, yeah, how best we answer them. Yeah. So let me look at what's been coming in. Um, I'll start with the top question, which I can't see exactly who was asked of, but I'll read it out loud. How do you generally go about with pricing and the actual selling of service design to startups since many are bootstrapping? Um, I think this might have come through in my talk. I'll, I'll be happy to give it a, an answer. It is quite challenging to sell yourself as a service designer and to get teams to pay for something that they may not really uh, be familiar with. Um, the real ideal situation actually is to be able to work with startups in a setting uh, such as an accelerator or um, an incubator where your bills as a service designer are being paid by a different organization. Um, that was some of the work I've been done with a, a Dutch bank here. I was being paid by the, the accelerator program, but supporting different startups. And it meant essentially that their budget wasn't being used um, for something that they weren't sure about. But in the end, I was still happy to say that they, they saw the value that I was bringing. So it can be a challenge to, to, sell, uh, to sell that in yourself. Also, I have in the, in the past run one free workshop with a, a startup as saying, here's some things that I can help you with. And this is an example of the way we work. And that was enough to get me that as a new client. So it might be a little bit of voluntary work um, in, in the beginning. Um, do you want to add anything, Mike, about how you might think to sell the, the skills of a service designer within a, 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 either a startup or an innovation lab? Yeah, yeah. I, I just building on what you were saying, Jesse. Uh, really, how how we do it from a yeah, corporate startup positioning is that we we stay away from the service designer label because that can sort of put you into a silo. But it's really about being a coach across the process. So if you can say, right, I can help you through problem exploration, solution validation, um, product market fit, for instance, then you're saying that you, you can support a team across the process, not just you know within a narrow area, but it's about selling yourself as a broad. Um, practitioner, I would say. Okay, so everyone, if you do open the Q&A, you can see that there's some questions in there. Um, we can, if you upvote them, I'll start to uh, ask the ones that have been the most voted, but I started with the top at the moment. Um, so here's a new one, and I think this is going to be for you, uh, Mike. How do you address, well, as a service designer, that the business model needs improving or to help them rethink it? Uh, when is it kind of not your place to say something about that. Um, yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I would say it, it really, it should be reflective of the innovation type that you're pursuing. So if you're doing something 
incremental as, as we looked at. Um, maybe there wouldn't be any changes to the business model. Maybe there's just some feature tweaks and, and performance improvements. Um, but if, you're, if the concept is starting to push into new markets with a new product and service, then almost certainly it will require a new business model because it, it doesn't exist in that form um, for, to, for that organization. So I would say if it's getting more radical and disruptive in terms of innovation types, then you've got a very strong justification to say, hey, we're doing something entirely new. This will require a new business model, and this is how I can help support you across business model innovation. Okay, great. Um, I'll go through a few of these, and then, um, so again, if you've got a question that hasn't been listed, please, uh, please do put it in there. Um, I'll take another one now from Constantine. Uh, they write, many startups are aiming to address a global market with their service or product from the moment of their inception. Considering that funding might be in, uh, non-existent, uh, resources and time are scarce, how can service design address all of this and help the startup grow? So I, I can take a shot at this. I do think that, um, of course, startups start with very big ambitions and uh, maybe short on funds and, and resources and time. I would say you should focus on where your skills are as a service designer and what your tools are. And unless you're a business designer and you really feel confident about tackling some of those questions, um, don't try to play in those discussions. I know that might sound a little bit cynical and I'm sure if you're in a startup, uh, you really are wanting to help them succeed. But I do think it helps to really focus on what your real value is and not perhaps get into, into the existential questions of how they're, how they're going to run. A lot of your input, of course, is going to help them um, in terms of understanding customers and, and, and testing their proposition. But I think some of the questions you've raised um, are really much more about the commercial aspect and the scaling aspect. Um, and I don't think that's the comfortable territory specifically for a service designer. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll jump in as well. Um, yeah, really, for a lot of startups and corporate teams, it's it's about figuring out what to focus on and what to rule out. So if you're trying to do something enormous, you most likely got way too many features in your development stack that um, aren't going to be able to do anything extremely well. They might do a lot of things all right, but that's not what people are looking at. So if you look at a lot of the apps in the in the app stores, they do one thing extremely well, better than everybody else. And those are the ones that scale. So if you're trying to do a bit of everything, you're not going to be able to get to the depth of uh, solving the problems in the best way that is actually what's going to drive your, your large scale adoption. So do small things really well, rather than lots of um, small things kind of okay. Okay, great. So I'll take another question that's at the top at the moment. And Nancy asks, what best practices have both of you uncovered regarding pseudo effective remote workshopping? Mm -hmm. um, so of course, I, I can say I've been just like in here, I guess, working in a remote setting, I've had to adapt the ways I've been I've been doing it. Um, I do think with with tools like Miro and Mural, and of course, platforms like Zoom or Teams or, or whatever you're using, um, you can do this. There is, I also should say, within the SDN community and on the SDN Slack, um, a lot of people sharing just what these techniques are. Um, and someone has also, someone in the UK has put together a nice Google, an open Google Doc, which is all about um, uh, yeah, what tools can be used, what methodologies can be used. According to Wikipedia, uh, Google my, Docs. My, <laughs> Google, my Google funds are being trying to help me as well. Um, so there is within the community a lot of talk about what what we can do. Um, it is I've got to say it's it's been it's been working for me to use a combination of mural and uh, a well structured set of canvases that have the rights for people to edit some things and not edit some other things. Um, but it is it is challenge and and of, of course. In the same way that Mike, are now, Mike and I are speaking to people that we can't see, there is a lot that you're missing in terms of the body language of people and how they respond. Um, but I've had, I've had some success. I don't know, Mike, if you can share uh, any other tips on doing these things nowadays through, through screens. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, a lot of the consulting space is built on getting people from all over the world, in some cases, in the same room together, physically interacting, and that obviously can't happen now. Um, so yeah, we've first thing we did at board was to put all of our tools and processes, all our templates, everything that we could uh, digitally onto Mural. Um, we've also experimented with Miro as well. Um, 
yeah, so we had some slight performance issues with Mural. I think some of those things have been ironed out now. Um, but yeah, we get everything um, onto, um, onto, onto those digital tools, platforms. So which we're doing the, the post-editing, if you like, uh, digitally, whilst using Zoom calls in the background, um, and then using the breakout room functionality. So we, we, we try to mirror and replicate as much as we can from the, the, the physical process that we usually run and then do that digitally. Um, even Google Docs is, is actually a really good one. It's super simple. Um, it has real time collaboration as well. Um, so yeah, I would just experiment with, with Google Docs and, um, and Mural and Miro and find one that fits the size of your team and the types of tools that you've got. But um, they, they do the job, just not as good. If I could even add another question and answer to this, that is um, how you can conduct user research nowadays. So workshops are one big part of our activity. My current clients, I'm focused on a project in Brazil and I've been spending weeks now carrying out uh, qualitative research with people in, in Brazil. Now, for the experience, they could be across Amsterdam from me, but they, they happen to be further around the world. We're using video calls. We're also considering doing things like sending portable cameras to people so that they can share a bit of, the, of their working environment. We ask them during calls to uh, also show us around what, what they're doing um, and what their, what their environment's like to try to mimic a bit what contextual interviews look like. Um, but of course, the contextual research aspect of, of service design is also uh, a bit challenged by these, this, new, this new normal. I'll go for a question from Serena. I also think uh, here in Amsterdam, she asks, what would be the best undercover job title for service designers? And I agree that a service designer consultant doesn't work. Um, I'll take a quick stab at this. I even put, I think on my LinkedIn profile, I say service designer and innovation consultant. Um, I won't position myself necessarily as the expert in, in, in the startup and all of that, but I do find that calling yourself an innovation consultant gives you sometimes a, a foot in the door as long as you don't lie and say that's your only work. Um, but innovation consultants uh, ha has helped me. I don't know, Mike, if you think there's other ways to sneak in a bit as a, as a chameleon. As a yeah, student. we have a few roles. We have business designer is quite a popular one as well. Cool. Um, innovation strategist is another one, but that's a bit more focused on the front end of the process. Uh, innovation coach, innovation consultant, constructive troublemaker. That's the one I like the most, um, but doesn't sell, sell itself. But yeah, really sort of the coach, try again, try and be more broad than just service design. So um, yeah, coaches and, uh, and consulting is the best ones. Okay, I'll take a question now from Floor, and I think it's really, it's a kind of a follow on to this, this chameleon concept. She says, what about if you're going in as a user researcher to do service design activities, is this more accepted or understandable for the company? Actually, I do think if you're a UX researcher, if you're a digital a, a product designer, um, you already have a lot more permission to play within a startup than you might do as a service designer. And you can convert that position you have, the knowledge you have, to start applying these skills that, that a service designer has. And then of course, uh, yeah, name them as such if you want to. So yes, I think if you're a UX researcher, if you're a digital product designer, um, you can, and you have an interest in service design and have some skills, you have already uh, some very good permission to, to start applying these things. Whether or not you call them as service design and, and might be confronted with some uh, funny, funny looks from your team, that's up to you. Um, but I'd say that you're, you're in a great position to, to do it. Yeah, I, the, the whole UX label, I, I think people get very confused between UX and UI and it, it, it can be quite challenging. So yeah, another one we use is human centered designer as well. That's um, a little bit more friendly or, or customer, uh, customer centric designer. That's another way of looking at or even a design thinker as well. Okay, Mike, I've got a question for you. Could you see service design working to transform organizational design? And why don't more business designers also implement organizational design? Okay, you see service design working to transform. Um, I see service design as a crucial element in organization design. And we've, we've had some long-term programs on reorganization design and culture. And we used a lot of uh, service design methods just to try and understand what's going on at the moment within uh, a division of a large organization. Um, so we sort of cherry picked methods as we needed, but we didn't label it as such um, 
but we, but it was a crucial element to understand really what was going on. This was a um, B two B enterprise division, so it was like a almost doing an audit of current capabilities and workflows, building up into agile development. So we really had to heavily rely on service design. So that did help there, um, and then the organization design element featured in um, through through doing that mapping. Um, Second part of your question, why, does it more, why don't more business designers also implement organization design? Um, at that stage, it depends on the size of the organization. So if you're a project team within a large corporate, trying to change the organization design is just going to be swimming against the current too much. Um, but if you're a smaller team, maybe a startup team, yeah, it's a bit more relevant. If you're an external entity, you can challenge the organization design. You can um, get some people time and resources to work outside of the mothership, if that makes sense. Um, but that doesn't typically come from a business design point of view. That's more of an overall project governance layer that makes, gives that green light or not. Um, so in the short answer, I don't really see business designers implementing organization design for in most cases in a corporate context. Okay, I'll go for another question that maybe we can both uh, uh, have a shot at. Maximilian asks, why hasn't service design reached strategic consultation so far or, or not as much as it should? Um, I think I can give a quick observation and that is that strategic consulting has a lot of um, interest in what we as service designers are doing and the, the, the great proof of that is seeing how the big, the big four consultancies are very busy over the last years, even up until um, uh, yeah, a few months ago um, with LiveWork, with Santa's colleagues uh, in Norway being taken over by PwC, a lot of those big consultancies have seen the value of service design and want to bring in the, the, yeah, the tools, the way of thinking, the, the designerly aspect of service designers and do it through acquisition. So I think strategic consultants are, are seeing our value, um, but Perhaps the question then is how much are they, are, are they really applying it and, and how is that working inside uh, once they find a place inside a big consultancy? Uh, Mike, do you have any reaction to that question from Maximilian? Yeah, it's a really good question actually. Um, so yeah, I mean, typically with strategic innovation design or innovation strategy, it's really about linking it up to the, the business and corporate level strategic intent. So this is where we are, that's where we want to go. And then it becomes, that's where service design and all the different approaches can fit in. Those should just be the vehicles to enable you to get from, we're here, we want to go there. Those are the vehicle options we've got, whether it's an internal incubator, whether it's a service design academy, whether it's design thinking um, trainings, whether it's, you know, whatever it is, there's lots of different approaches, but I see service design as one of many, many options in order to get you from where you are now strategically to where you want to be. But that's, it's got to link up you know, very closely to the corporate and, and, and business level strategies. Okay, I'll go for a question from Maya. She says, it seems that there's quite an overlap of the activities and responsibilities of service designers and UX or user researchers. They're both managing the knowledge acquisition process. Um, what is your experience with this issue in practice? Um, I think again, within startup contexts, there is already a clear presence of UXers and often user researchers as well. So I wouldn't say there's an overlap uh, uh, per se, where there is a service designer in the team, then yes, as a service designer, you do share some skills there, but I do think you come in with a different perspective. You, you're probably operating at a bit of more strategic level and you wouldn't be um, so much in the product experience at the screen level, for example, that the UXer might be doing. Um, you'd be touching more on strategy, for example, and the, the, the holistic experience. And also user researchers, of course, are really focused on the design research activities, but I wouldn't expect them to be uh, touching the, the strategy so much either. So I do think, as in any setting, actually, as a service designer, you'll overlap with those roles, um, but you do have a different strategic uh, remit to the work you're doing. Yeah, and yeah, in terms of the overlap from from my perspective, it's um, yeah. Usually, when you're when you're in a, a corporate project team or even a startup, you come in with one kind of skill set, but you have to, as you know, you have to rapidly do everything. You have to be a, a one man or woman um, rock star that can just do a little bit of everything. So those defined 
roles very, very quickly get broken down and you end up doing yeah, user research if you're a service designer or a little bit of business modeling if you're a design thinker. It's just all hands on deck with a limited runway to get things going. Okay, I'll ask you a question from Anna. She says, in corporate startup projects where there's great pressure to deliver, for example, use cases for digital projects, how can we get more time from the client to do proper discovery activities? Okay, and I think you're asking a question which is also relevant to non-startups just as much. I think it's a, it's a, a challenge any service designer has to address, essentially, how are you getting um, yeah, time to do your work and time to do research. I can say, and I think one of my colleagues is listening in on this call so he can uh, commiserate with me. I'm in a situation with a current client where we're seeing that our design research is probably being a bit crimped for um, project planning reasons. Um, and it's always, it's, it's always going to be a fight. And I think you have to say, if it's a startup context, that the risk is they're going to be going with either their assumptions or uh, a solution that they haven't tested or value proposition they haven't tested. So my, my uh, answer to this would be to, again, reinforce why you're there and that you're helping protect them even perhaps from making bad business decisions. I think that will probably fall in their ears a little harder than just saying I'm a designer and you should listen to me, that you're helping them uh, learn more about what they're trying to do, learn, learn more about their customers, um, validate their, their propositions faster, um, and that you need the time, honestly, or properly to do that. Yeah, I, I would also uh, try and approach some middle managers as well and get some historical data on previous projects that, they're, that have run and failed that haven't done that, and then quantifying the cost and the impact on the company for a failed project. And you, you know, that'll very quickly justify spending a little bit more time in comparison to the future failures that could, could be happening. Um, another one to do is to listen very closely to the language that people are using within the project team or even the sponsors and the, the governance team. Um, if you hear things like, we think that, I'm sure that my gut feeling is any kind of language like that that's not, va that's not evidence based justified um, validation, you can quickly call them up and say, well, what do you know and how do you know? What's the evidence for what you're saying that's going to inform our decision making? And if you, if, if the team doesn't have that evidence, it'll very quickly emerge as well. So just, yeah, listen for triggers in the language to uh, find those uh, uncertain uh, unknowns that people are claiming are known. Okay, I'll go for, let's say, two more questions. The first, um, Barry is asking, in what industries would you like to see more service design? Um, I think it's really true that you'll, if you walk into any bank, you'll find lots of service designers walking around nowadays. I'm working on a big client now that's in the agriculture space, but I think you could say in not just agriculture, but every, any heavy industry perhaps, um, they are not nearly as concerned with uh, fickle consumers and, and things like that. And they're generally a bit slower moving um, and more technology oriented. And even by that, I can mean mechanical technology, not, to, not just digital technology. And therefore, I think that there's a lot of fertile ground for us as service designers. So perhaps in, in industry and agriculture um, and uh, yeah, not, not the high tech industries, not um, things like banks where there's consumer demand is forcing people to really think about the service they offer. But within industry where there's uh, also lots of money, they, they're, they're willing to make investments, but where design itself is, is kind of unfamiliar and where service design then uh, of course would be unfamiliar because at the end of the day they're they're also delivering services so yeah. i think that's that to me would be um some some suggestions i don't know mike if you think there's other places that we we should be that we're not currently yeah there's probably some personal bugbears um government the uk government's generally pretty good with it but i think more broadly governments need to certainly at the moment, embrace service design and, and, and the failings of not doing that. Um, the legal world, that's undergoing massive disruption and they're burying their heads in the ground massively about it, you know, blockchain and all the rest of it. Um, so that, that's something that needs drastic application of service design. And also in, um, in, in service, serviceization of B2B, that's not a, too many keywords, but in the B2B world, particularly in industrial markets, it's a huge service industry and, and most business is done in B2B, um, but yet things like service design rarely apply to it. Okay, I'll take one more question before we, we uh, close off for the evening. Um, and that is, 
uh, well, maybe two. I see someone I know writing another one. Um, someone asks, can you provide a concrete example of one specific service, of one specific intervention done for a startup from a service, service design perspective that was a key factor for their success? Um, I can share some work that I've been doing for a client late last year. They are in the uh, public impact space here in the Netherlands. They actually work with refugees. Um, and they were also in the blockchain space. I, Mike just mentioned that. They, had a, they have a blockchain-based solution to uh, handle how refugees are, are being serviced, not just in the Netherlands, but around the world. And they were uh, also falling into the trap that I think not just startups, but any, any, any company can do, that they, have a, they really had a solution in mind that they wanted to bring to the market and were quite confident it would work. And once I had built up enough trust with them about what, my, what I could bring and, and, and the value I had, I said, look, let's take a step back. You, you do have a, a, a really interesting proposition. They even had a half working product at the moment. And I said, let me spend some time researching your target market. And I spent a few weeks doing research with refugees and asylum seekers here in the Netherlands. Uh, very interesting from a personal perspective, but what I learned and what I presented back to them gave them some pretty critical uh, reaction and things to think about for what their product looked like. They had made, and just to take one specific example, um, a bit of a risky assumption on how technologically oriented some of their, their target customers, their target market would be, those are, are refugees in the Netherlands. That came about, I think, because one of the startup founders himself was a blockchain expert and a Syrian, super interesting guy, but as I went out and I met representational refugees in the Netherlands, a lot of them uh, were having the most basic of smartphones. Um, some didn't even have a, have a smartphone and they were so uh, caught up in the day-to-day -day life and the bookkeeping and, and record, records and red tape of refugee process that they weren't looking for online services to support them. So I helped them in, in that case um, specifically. That's a great case. Yeah, maybe a last one for me. Yeah, the B Post, um, uh, the Belgian Postal Service and Zalando partnership that um, their startup teams been working on, that was something that really had a very broad service that needed mapping because they were looking to significantly disrupt it. Um, so service design was really key in, in prioritizing what were the major, the major pain point issues in existing services in order to develop features of a new startup that would directly solve those big pain points that have you know, been, been sat there for maybe 15 years or so. So it was a very important and also to get to some really risky assumptions about unlocking people's doors and things. So it was, it was a very, very key in that, in that startup. Well, and the last question, and I have to give credit to this person because I know they're awake at a very uh, strange time in the morning. Uh, and it's coming from New Zealand, the opposite of the first question. So this is aimed at you, Mike. While startups tend to embrace change, what tips do you have to convince larger organizations and specifically the C-suite level to act on stated commitments to being customer driven, to experimenting at speed and, and things like that? So essentially, how can we convince them to embrace a startup mindset while de-risking their position? De-risking their position. Um, okay. Um, so again, it, this, it, always, it should start with a good innovation strategy session. So it's, it's really about what is the business trying to do um, and, and how are you going to get there? And so really the, these kind of approaches, they provide the answers to the how. It's more the kind of operational level. How are we actually going to run and execute these projects? Why is this approach quicker, faster, cheaper, better, quantifying everything that you can, setting up key metrics, being accountable for the whole project, setting up a yeah, governance structure um, so that you can kill projects earlier on um, that aren't su being supported correctly for the strategy, um, creating a, a portfolio of projects with different risk profiles as well. So having a portfolio approach to innovation. So it's, it's really about making sure that you align whatever it is you're going to do with what the company is trying to achieve and providing it can uh, be tracked and you can have the right metrics to show your your progress in an incremental sense you give the c-suite um, a process which they can easily manage by um, checking in on the, the progress on the, the impact metrics the activity metrics of your projects and then they can be killed off quickly so 
it's really about being able to kill projects um, uh, quickly and early and cheaply. That's probably the, the most um, valuable selling point for these kind of these kind of projects. Um, I mean, no company doesn't want to be customer centric. They generally just don't know how to do it. They don't have that reflex. They don't have a process to support doing it. Um, so yeah, showing them that you, you can actually manage this fluffy process, that it's not something that it's only for the top tech giants to do or, or disruptive startups, that any organization can learn it. It's a structured process. You know, we've introduced you to some of you what that process is. So um, yeah, take those slides, put it on the agenda and show that the process can be managed cheaply and effectively. Okay. So um, I think we should, uh, with that as a last question, I know there's some more that we didn't get to, so I apologize for that, but I'm a little also aware of the time. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. It's been a good experience. I'm apologizing that we, with some technical difficulties, couldn't get through the interactive part. Um, I know Stina put a lot of time into that, and I'm sorry her connection wasn't there. I hope we can, in a future event, um, introduce that as well. So thanks, thanks, Stina. We're, we're sorry we couldn't do that. Thank you again. On, on uh, behalf of me and Mike and the rest of the SDN Netherlands team for joining this. Um, please also join future events. You can follow us on Meetup. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for being here. I'll, I'll include my URL that I promised in, in my presentation. So it's in the group chat. Mike, if you want to also add any URLs to things you've shared, um, please feel free. And thank you, else, thank you for uh, everyone joining and hope to see you at another event. Brilliant. Thank Goodbye. you very much, everyone. Thanks a lot.